I'm so happy that you're here. This is a not only musicians funnies, but you're pretty much probably the most professional funny person that I've ever had on musicians funny. Well, so that's, that's very kind of you to say. Oh well, so, you know, most people in uh, this country, the UK, um, they think of me as um, a comedy actress, and you know that my roots are actually from music. And yes, went to London with my, you know looking for the pot of gold on the pavements of London and from Liverpool. Yeah. And um, my progeny is quite good from Liverpool. Um, but more yes. about that later. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, but, you know, coming down to London, I, I got thrown into having to read music, which was nice, having to sight sing. You know, not many people do it these days, no. you know, being able to uh, sight sing. And the first album I did was a Rosemary Clooney album. Wow. And um, and then I was working with the great Dale Newman, who was a fantastic yeah, arranger. And that's true. Yeah. He passed away recently. It was sad to hear. But he had a very good long life. I think he lived to 92. Nice. And I loved him. Dale Newman got me um, involved with lots of sessions after that because he thought, oh, she's young. She'll do what she's told uh -huh. and she can read music. And she's quite amusing. Yeah. And, and that was when I first heard everybody call, calling headphones cans, you know, cans or more music in the cans. I didn't yes. know what they were talking about. Huh. And of course, I got it wrong and asked for some tins, you know. Nice. Um, nice. And I mean, things that happened to me when I was a young girl, I mean, this, you know, they wouldn't happen these days. If they did, you'd be jailed or cancelled. Yes. Um, somebody once made me remove um, a brassiere I was wearing because it was making a lot of noise, static noise on. Oh, the it was. Yeah. This is how long ago it was, you know. Yeah. But, um, and I sang with Howard Keel and I, some, some really fantastic acts that my parents were going, well, this is marvelous. We, we've heard of these people. This is great. <laughs> Rosemary Clooney and Howard Keel. Well, you're really getting on with the youngsters, you know. Yeah. And um, so London was exciting because I was a backing singer, but I kept thinking, oh, I want to do, I want to be up front, you know. And then I backed Jose Feliciano and, and I thought, this is good fun, but I want to do it myself out front. And before I got the chance to be a solo singer, I used to make my money on the side as a, a cocktail pianist in Liverpool. Nice. And, you know, you try going for a cocktail in Liverpool in the 70s. Nobody even heard. Nobody knew what cocktails were. No. In Liverpool. They'd say, uh, do you have a, a Tia Maria and Lucas Aid? That would be a nice cup. They just thought they thought you could just mix any drink together sure. and you could drink it, you know. Well, they could. And... <laughs> yeah, so I played the piano in a few cocktail lounges for a while because piano is my instrument. And and that was interesting because, you know, you're playing, you're sort of, you know, you're doing your crystal gale, you know, don't it make my brown eyes, you know. Yeah. And I used to sing along to some of them and people used to shout, hey, do you know any Iron Maiden? You know, it's like, how do you play Iron Maiden on the piano? I don't know how you do that. You probably can do that. Well, I can't play the piano at all, which is always surprises people because they always think I'm a piano player. I'm not. Yeah, I remember that about you. I think I once asked you and you said, don't ask me. Yeah, no, I mean, in fact, I just wrote a piano book, but I and I say in the beginning of the book, I don't play the instrument, but, you know, I write for it a lot. And so I, I understand it. And yeah, uh, yeah that, I mean, that's what the book is all about. It's, it's yeah. about how, to, yeah. how to create grooves on the piano, which I know how to do as an arranger. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I came down to London and um, my second cousin, who is Paul McCartney, as you know. Yes, indeed. Um, he's, he's my mom's first cousin. And so he helped me a little bit in that he paid for me to have some demo tapes done. Nice. And so so, so people kind of heard me and because and, he had a bit of faith in me. They thought, oh, this girl can write some tunes. You know, she's pretty good. And uh, he was very encouraging. And, you know, I'd had that thing of being a young girl growing up in Liverpool with a Beatle as a cousin, everyone thinks you're a liar for yeah. a start because everybody yeah. said they had a Beatle for a cousin. So you didn't bother telling anyone. It was like, yeah, sure. no, no point saying that to anybody at a party when you're 12 yeah. because they're going to say, yeah, yeah, and my cousin's John Lennon, you know. Yeah. But it, but yeah. he really was, and he was very helpful when I first went down to London. Well, that's and, cool. um, I don't think yeah. there's anything wrong with nepotism as long as you keep it in the family. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then I started singing a few adverts, but then I found that I could do other people's voices because people know me in, in the UK as an impressionist as well as a right. comedian. And so I started doing Karen Carpenter type singing 
for adverts, you know, and um, and singing all sorts of terrible adverts. And I, I, Richard, I don't know if you've ever written any awful adverts musically. I'm sure you haven't, but I'm sure you've written the music for some terrible copy. <laughs> well, I've had to arrange some terrible, some terrible jingles yes. that I was given. But usually, when I got a chance to write them, I, I got away with murder. Well, the worst, <laughs> the thing, my worst one was um, for Ireland. It was a, a very small company called Allenson's Carpets, mm -hmm. and the jingle was Allenson's Carpets, almost nationwide. <laughs> <laughs> almost. It actually had almost in the jingle. Almost nationwide. Yeah. You couldn't be nationwide in Ireland. It was like, no, oh, no, that's too much, you know. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're just almost. <laughs> yeah. I, you, could and, do um, a, you should have written a song called I Almost Love You. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, great, great I mean, some of the adverts, I mean, there'd be like voiceovers saying, you know, uh, manure decided to come and pick up your manure. The, the Irish ones were the best. There was one um, we got sent to, um, do you know Tim Whitnell? He's a great singer. I, I don't. Tim Whitnell is a funny guy too. And he, he tells a story of when he went to a, a guy who'd written a jingle for his company. He was a solicitor. Now, that's always a disaster because they think they can write music and they can't. And it was for Robert's solicitors. Nice. And they were, and and, and he said, uh, it goes like this, so uh, Robert's solicitors. So the singers were going, okay, Robert's solicitors. Yeah, that's okay. Let's do it again. Robert's solicitors. He said, yes, I'll do the next bit. And it goes, we specialise in wills. <laughs> and they go, okay. <laughs> Robert's solicitors we specialize in wills we specialize in wills okay Robert's solicitors we specialize in wills it's okay so we're getting there and then he went oh I've got another line it goes we specialize in wills and he goes when there's a death in the family <laughs> yes. and he wanted a triplet thing on death in the family yeah, when there's nice. a death in the family you know so um you're always laughing at those kind of things. And, you know, I remember Bob Saker, the great session singer, Bob yes. Saker, once telling me that he was singing along to an advert. He didn't know what it was for, but he was just asked, can you do Louis Armstrong doing Wonderful World? He said, of course I can. He said, I see trees of green, red roses too, I see them blue for me and you. And he turned the page and he just said, I think to myself, what a wonderful world of leather. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was that kind of so effort. it was great training though doing all those adverts because because I just I got to meet the most amazing musicians and singers and um and then I got to lark around and be silly and do funny voices and then I got picked up as a kind of impressionist and then I ended up I had a hit record first and then I ended up with my own comedy show singing as well so it was great you know I'm a bit of an all-rounder, really. Well, now, it, I also, it, it, I find it fascinating. I, I remember you were on Crossroads. Crossroads, yeah. Right. No, people in, you guys over there probably don't know what Crossroads is. But yeah. yeah, I mean, it was the worst soap opera ever, but it was the best as well. Right. And, you know, um, I would um, come on a bit hungover because we, we, we did it as a live show. And the only way you could get to stop tape, as it was in those days, was to swear right down the bottle of the lens. And yeah, and I just didn't have the bottle to do that. I was 20 years old, wasn't I? And I was singing a song every time I walked into that blooming motel. I was singing the song because the producer of the program was on a cut of the royalties of the record. I was ah. Okay. So corrupt. I mean, it actually wouldn't happen now. So I was turning up in the motel going, hi, can I have Chalet 23, please? More than in love. <laughs> You're a part of me and the feelings. Oh, thank you so much. See you later. Um, to call my acting wooden would do a disservice to trees. <laughs> I remember one day there was a cleaning lady and she was like coming on with this vacuum cleaner. And she was hooting, making this really loud noise and no one could hear the dialogue. And the sound man's looking at me going, just pitch it up. So I'm going, 20, shall it 23, please? Shouting over this woman cleaning the foyer. And someone shouted, cut. And then the director ran down onto the floor. He went, cut. He said, I can't hear a bloody thing because of that vacuum cleaner. And someone said, oh, I'm sorry, Mike. It's a typing error on the script. It should say Mrs. Brownlow hovering in the background. Oh, 
Yeah. And she was hoovering, you know. So, I mean, things like that um, were inspirational, really, because it made Victoria Wood write um, Acorn Antiques, which was yes. a spoof of the whole thing. Yes, it was. But, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a strange old time because I had this hit record that sold half a million. And then I... And then I didn't, you know, and I was a one hit wonder. And then you go back to what you were doing before and people say to you, well, hang on a minute. You've had a hit record. You shouldn't be doing sessions again now. And I said, well, it's what I know. And it's so I went back to session singing and then I got my own TV series. So that was nice. Right. But tell me when you when you had the record, I assume you were completely ripped off and had a terrible deal. Because otherwise, you, you would have at least made a little money. Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the, um, not Simon May, Simon May is was, was, was a decent, decent chap. He's a, a really good bloke. But the other guy involved was producing it. He held on to a, in those days, there were checks. He held on to a check for like six months. And I think it was PRS check that I should have got, you know, and it was like, oh, uh, do I have to give this to you? And I'm like, yes, you do. It's, it was terrible, really. There wasn't the, the admin was nowhere near as good as it is today. The admin was like, you had to ring somebody up. Please, can I have my royalties? You know, you probably didn't know as much about that side of it as you did later. No, um, and and then of course I had cousin Paul McCartney saying, "Well, you must always buy your own publishing." You know, yes. And, so, and how do you go about doing that? You know, I wrote a show theme tune called "Surprise, Surprise" for Silla Black, which yeah. is just about to be used in a Tesco commercial. I'm pleased to say. But, you know, I've, I've had the same deal with the publisher for that for 40 years. It's never changed, you know. And, uh, yeah. you know, he's got 40% of it. I've got 60. And it's, you know, you think yes. after 40 years, surely it reverts back to me. No. Nope. Yes. Well, yeah. I mean, the business is, is so different. And, and uh, as it's changed, one thing has remained the same, which is that people will get ripped off. And it's usually the oh. artist, the songwriter, the singer. And, I don't uh, know how people make money with streaming, because at least... The analog thing of buying physical records was something you knew you'd sold records because people bought them. Um, and now with streaming, it's you really have to sell an awful lot of records. To, uh, Even if you sell an awful lot. I mean, you know, there's the famous story that everybody talks about, the song yeah. Happy. Apparently, yeah. uh, Pharrell only made $250 from all of, the, all of the streaming. So, you know, it's, it's really not the way to make money. Yeah. But this is probably not the funniest thing we can discuss because I mean I no. will start ranting and we don't no, want to. Start let's ranting. not. Let's let's no. talk about more funny things. Yeah. <laughs> one, well, it's a, what I would really love you to talk about a little bit is you're so well known for doing uh, voices and parodies of voices. I'd love you to give my audience a little masterclass in how you actually do that. Like for instance, with spitting image. Oh, my God, yeah. that's like. So I mean, iconic. Spitting Image was Spitting Image was incredible at the time. Nobody had ever seen puppets like it. Um, now it doesn't have the same impact because it, it's a bit analog, isn't it? Now everything's CGI. But Spitting Image was amazing. And I, I went on as a, a singing um, impressionist on it. I did Tina Turner. They did a parody of a Tina Turner song. Yes. It was a simply the rest or something. And I just did yeah. a Tina Turner voice. And then they said, you can do the Queen, can't you? And I said, well, yes, one does try to do the Queen because she has a very imitable voice. And of course, as she's got older, the Queen's voice has got older. And as I get older, my voice gets older too. So I started doing the Queen and then um, I started doing Princess Anne. And then she's got quite a long nose. And so her nose, her nose is part of how she sounds. Actually, when I met her, I met Princess Anne in a lineup and I didn't know whether she watched Spitting Image. And I was like, I didn't really want her to know that I saw. Sort of and somebody said, um, she said to me, Yes, want to meet you. Yes, what do you do? And I said, I didn't know whether to say I'm a singer, actor, clown. And I just went, I'm an impressionist. And she said, Oh, Marcus, do you have an exhibition on anywhere? And <laughs> she thought I was an impressionist painter, which kind of got me out of the ship, really. Yeah, nice. <laughs> And then I did Sarah Ferguson, who was always in trouble with the rest of the royals. She was this, and I, she's got a similar sort of shaped face to me. And so, and she used to speak like that, you know. <laughs> and I gave her a laugh that she never actually did, but it, it became synonymous with her because it, I always had her saying things like, <laughs> they've named a pudding after me at Buckingham Palace. It's called Ginger Sponge. <laughs> 
And I gave her that snort, poor woman. She's never done that in her life. And when I met her, she said to me, um, I, oh, gosh, oh, you do my voice. Uh, why did you give me that terrible snort? And I wanted to say, because I just can't stick you. I don't like you very much. But I didn't. I was polite. <laughs> I think I just said, oh, you look like you sort of <laughs> would laugh like that. <laughs> But it is awkward when you meet people you've been doing impressions of. But most people were, were very proud of their spitting image puppets and they wanted you to do them. But you must never do an impression of someone to their face. That's the no. thing. Because your head, you know about your head and your ears, serves as a very strange speaker. So the first time you ever hear yourself talking on a tape when you were a little boy, say, you probably thought you sounded weird. Because yes. your head, you don't think you sound like that. Indeed. So when you do an impression of somebody, they go, that's nothing like me. It's pointless doing it. Wait till they've gone out the door, their backs turn and do it immediately just for laughs. <laughs> but um, doing, yeah, politicians and, um, I mean, I did Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher for a while. Yes. Well, you know, you really should subscribe to Radio Richard. But Margaret Thatcher's voice was like that, you see. And she spoke with a very tamed voice that she'd had elocution for. And because apparently she spoke much more high pitched like that. And somebody told her years before, you know, if you want to be taken seriously as a, a, a member of parliament, you have to speak clearly and slowly. And then she sort of pitched it in a sort of alto range and sounds rather like a man, you know. Yes. But um, I met her once, she, her breath smelt of whiskey, but never mind, there you go. Yeah. Um, she's, I'm sure she said nice things about me. Um, but no, doing Spinning Image was a fantastic uh, yes. time. It was, um, we, we used to have a lawyer sitting next to us as we recorded, you know, because they'd be going, no, 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 you can't do that. But the reason we got away with so much naughty stuff was because, and I don't even know this, it is a bit of a great legal area, but because they were puppets and not people, we could do it. We could say it. So we could have somebody banging their secretary against a desk, you know, at lunchtime, like lots of politicians were. And, and still we could do. show it. We could we could depict it as puppets because it right. wasn't people. Right. Yeah. That's how we got away with it. There's a thing that you have done so well and that you have to do to make an impression. And that is there's more than the voice and the physicality of it. There's also the attitude. And I mean, you see that with Thatcher, you've got, I mean, I, I met her a, a couple of times only because I was playing in a restaurant and she, she was very nice. And I can't say anything against her because she no. was very nice to come up to us and say, jolly good. Usually most people in a restaurant, yeah, they just ignore you. But, but, but there's something about her voice that you've got very well, which is that feeling of, well, you're only a child, and I have to explain this to you very carefully because very patronizing. Yes, yes, very much, and you've got that in the emotional thing, and I but think with all the characters you have to do that. But I can't help thinking she probably didn't speak like that when she was at home with her husband and her kids because she was not from a posh family. She was no. not from a well-spoken background. No, she was from a very um, working class. That her dad was a grocer. And she's, you know, she taught herself to speak like that, almost like the sort of royals. Now, the royals really do speak like, I mean, they speak like a Pathé newsreel. You know, yeah. and here comes Princess Margaret looking absolutely radiant, you know, like circa 1959. Yeah. They still sound like that, a lot of the royals. And then the young royals, like uh, um, Kate Middleton, you know, they've got this lovely sort of, yeah, kind of sound that Princess Diana had which we call Sloan Ranger sound. It's all like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And it's all like, hey, yeah, I'm vegetarian now. Yeah, it's like that, you know, yeah. Yes, and, the, and they also change the vowel sounds of a lot of words as well. I think in general, that's happening in the English language. Yeah, you know, I'm getting, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, I mean, my uh, accent has changed over the years because you, you, when you come down from Liverpool, I, I was much more talking like that, you know, not, not, not like that. I, you know, some people in the middle are really, really thick no. accent like that. I wasn't like that, but I was, I had flat A's, or, you know, and my, um, I'd say, I love that and I love this. And, yes. you know, um, and I still say bath and glass like yes. Americans do, yes. but that's just a Liverpool way. And then, and then I had these children and then I gave birth to three children who grew up saying, mummy, can I take a bath? And I go, oh, I've got posh kids. Yes. How did that happen? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, and 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 another thing where you've had to use your voice, which I'm very impressed by, is the show Just a Minute. That I mean, I know I'm I'm a I'm a septic, and I shouldn't even know about this, but people forget <laughs> that I lived in England for 50 years, and I yeah. love that show, and I'd love to hear some stories about about doing that because you have to get you have to really concentrate. They didn't ask me back that many times. I was quite annoyed. Um, I did it. I think I did about four shows. Um, just a minute is quite terrifying. It is quite terrifying. And you see, in that situation, I don't know how to talk because I don't know whether I should go into my RP, which is received pronunciation for those yes. who don't know. Yes. Because I can talk like, you know, Joanna Lumley if I want to. Absolutely fabulous, darling, sweetie. And yes. she's always writing books about Prince Philip. And she's becoming a dame next week. And, she, you know, it's worked. You know, it's absolutely sweetheart. So I can talk like that if I want to. Yeah. But when I'm doing just a minute, I'm thinking, well, do I, which, which is my, I don't even know what my own voice is. I suppose it's what I am doing talking to you, I guess. But I think I'm tempering it slightly. Um, but no, just a minute. Oh, no, it's terrifying. It's, it, and the others are so good and know how to do it. And, and you can't believe that you've repeated something they say you've just repeated that you can't believe it you can't believe how many times you say a word in a sentence over and over again right, it's, right. It's a, for my for my american viewers i must yeah. say this is it you just explain what the show is because just you, a minute. you have you're given a subject and you have to talk one on minute. the subject for one minute without hesitation repetition or deviation yeah so and if and, you do um, you're sunk you're out yeah so if we were talking about um, Richard Niles on the radio, and I start now, well, Richard Niles on the radio is um, a very good person to listen to on the radio. Oh, you've just said radio twice. They are, you're out. Right, right. <laughs> and, and are you allowed to say um? No, no, because that's hesitation. No, you can't hesitation. say um. Yeah. No. And of course, with you, deviation was difficult to avoid. Well, you know, <laughs> I like a bit of deviation occasionally. <laughs> Poor Blimey, so, me. It's been a very, very interesting career. I came out of Spitting Image and then got back into my singing a bit. And, and you know, I've done albums and you've arranged for me, Richard, your amazing arrangements, I have to say. Well, when I got divorced, fun. I went back to when I got divorced, I went back to music because I I just I was so miserable. I couldn't be funny. And so I just thought I'll just sing for a while. So I sang for a few years and then I got back into my being a bit amusing and got some nice parts. And I've I've been in every classic comedy. I've worked with John Cleese, I worked with Victoria Wood, I've worked with Richard, um, Peter Kay. But of course, um, and I'm getting up to what I'm coming into, which what obviously I want to plug in January, yeah. is um, you know, is being in Afterlife 3. You know, which Ricky Gervais wrote me the most wonderful role. And it starts January 14th. And um I play um an oddball, I can only say this, I, I'm not allowed to uh, reveal anything yet. I play an oddball authoress or author, you don't have to say authoress, do you? No, you're not an allowed. oddball yeah. author, an oddball author who is also a bit of um, a medium. And I speak like this. I, it's a, I've just, I don't know, I gave her this voice. And he'd seen me do um, an impression of a person called Kim Woodburn. Now, Kim Woodburn, for those in the UK, is a cleaning reality television woman who gets drunk on reality programmes and is very amusing and says things like, I'm leaving this show. You're all dirty, stinking, filthy bitches. And, and, and it's, she's quite outrageous. And when I, he saw my impression of her, he said, I've written a part for you in Afterlife. And I was like, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> and he said, but she's a little bit like that woman. And so my hair's up in a big bun like Kim Woodburn has. Nice. And he said, but she's a nicer person and she's very, she's a bit softer and... And we worked on the character anyway. So yeah, and you I have also, an exclusive. <laughs> yeah, I, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the subject that you were in Grumpy Old Women. Yeah. And the, and to me that, I loved Grumpy Old Men and Grumpy, because yeah. I, I love ranting myself. You know, I have a yeah. rant every once in a while. And I'm wondering, you know, considering the way the world is and how much there it is. It wasn't good for my dating life though, because not that I, I've given up dating, by the way. Oh, I'm a single woman and I'm going to stay single. But when I was doing Grumpy Old Women about five years ago, and I was still quite interested in the opposite sex, 
I, it was <laughs> terrible because people would go, oh, you're in that program, you're in that show, Grumpy Old Women, you're doing a live show, you're doing a tour. And people thought you were like, um, I don't know what they thought when they came to see it. It's just women being funny and moaning about a few things. Yeah. But but I was like the one, I was supposed to be the one who was a, a little bit sexy. <laughs> I can't say the word sexy without just saying it like that. Yeah. Sexy. <laughs> and I was supposed to be a bit like that. And <clears throat> the other two were a bit like, oh, no, we don't want to have sex anymore. Anyway, I've ended up like the other two anyway. <laughs> I don't ever want to have sex ever again. <laughs> anyway, it's a bit nice for that. Tell me this, what is the absolute funniest thing that has happened to you when you were trying to make a living? I do want to tell you a story that a musician told me. There's a trombone player in a circus and he's so sick of being in a circus and he, he he's just fed up with it. And so he decides to go and see Simon Rattle, who at the time this joke was written, was, I think, conducting the, we'll say, the Berlin Philharmonic. Yes. And he, he, he hangs around and everybody every day, and they're going into rehearse the Berlin Philharmonic are saying, who's this guy? And someone says he's a trombone player in the, in the Russian circus or whatever, you know, he, he, he wants to play with the, the Philharmonic. And he says, please give me a chance. Please, Mr. Rattle, give me a chance as he walks through. Just give me a chance. And Simon Rattle says, look, we're just about to start rehearsing. I can't just audition you on the spot. He said, I will play anything. I can ad-lib, I can read, whatever you want. And he says, well, we're about to do Eine Kleine Nacht music, Mozart's, you know, famous piece. I mean, uh, do you know it? He went, go on, you start. And I'll go. So Simon Rattle goes, and the trombone player goes, that's a joke you have to be a singer to, to tell. <laughs> oh, it made me laugh. Okay, tell me this. What's the worst? Thing that's ever happened to you on a session? I think the worst thing was, well, actually, when Doreen Chanter and I sang on a hit record called Story of the Blues, which got very high in the charts, the Story of the Blues, and it was two females singing that as the big wailing chorus by yes. Pete Wiley wrote it. It was for WAH, W-A-H. Right. Yes. I've become really good friends with Pete since all this happened. But at the time, what was awful about it was, when it was in the charts, going up the charts, number six, um, top of the pop, they did top of the pops and they substituted us for two other young girl singers who just looked different to us. Yeah. I mean, and Doreen Chanter wasn't having it. She rang the musicians union and said that it's not their voices. They can't mime to us, blah, blah, blah. And they got him. He was blacklisted from the BBC for quite a while and it stopped the record getting to number one. It would have got to number one. And the good thing about Twitter and social media is that I have since connected with him and said, have you ever forgiven us? It wasn't me. It wasn't me. And I, you know, Doreen admits it was her. She said, no, I reported it. I wouldn't have reported it. Right. Because I'm not a squeal. <laughs> <laughs> but um, things like that, you kind of go, oh, I feel a bit red faced just thinking about it, you know. Um, because it was awful for him because his record didn't get to number one and it was firing up the charts and he just didn't do Top of the Pops for a long time and and yeah, he was blacklisted for six months, I think it was. But yeah, it's pretty but bad, whose that, decision, isn't it? Whose decision was it that they had to replace the visual? It was a visual one. It yes. was a visual one. Um, the girls looked very different to us, you know. They, we were like, I don't know, two Caucasian girls. They were like... Uh, whatever you know yes. girls and they were just they, they looked amazing actually and I think they were just I don't think they were singers I think they were dancers which yeah. often, often happens come on you know yes. people use dancers for videos I was like oh great at least you can yeah. hear my voice I yeah. wasn't bothered at all but um yeah things like that you kind of go yeah. um I also <laughs> once had I was doing a, a one woman um show at uh, Edinburgh and I went and did um, a corporate after I'd finished it. And, uh, and one of the things I did was um, songs that never made it in musicals. And it was like, I'd, I'd make up these songs that I said that didn't make, like this songs that didn't make Oliver was, Bill Sykes can't get it up. <laughs> He's always too drunk of a night time. So <laughs> I'm hoping tonight he won't sup. Cause Bill Sykes cannot get it up. And that was... An, Oh, that was quite a good song. So Nan, it was Nancy singing that. I did um, Mary Poppins singing to Bird. I've 
never heard a Cockney accent quite like that. You know, <laughs> you really sound so awful. Oh, you sound such a prat, you know. <laughs> and so that was the song that didn't make. And it was a lovely idea, actually. Actually, Great I should idea. revisit that idea. Songs that never made the music. Terrific idea. It was, it was like the songs that got cut, you know. Mm. Anyway, I got booked. Um, my then husband was doing the sound for me and um, Keith. We're good friends still, by the way. And uh, he came and did the sound for me. And I did a run through. Um, it was only a little slot. It was a 20 minute slot, quite a lot of money. And it was in a, the Grosvenor in London. And I, I did the sound check. And the guy said, yeah, OK, it was cash paid on the day and all this. Right. And, uh, I started sitting. So when the audience came in, they were sitting there. When I started, I, I started with the Oliver Bill. So I can't get it up. It's quite green. <laughs> Um, and um, this man just started walking towards me and he went, stop, stop this filth, stop the filth. Mm. Anyway, it was a, a really, I won't say the name of the religion, but it was a, re we didn't know it was a religious um, gathering. Oh, right. <laughs> this guy who'd organised it, he, he said he didn't listen to the sound check, you know, didn't listen to the words. And he stopped me and, and I went, what, what? And he just stopped me. Stop this film. Well, <laughs> I can laugh is... about it now. <laughs> but honestly, I didn't laugh about it for five years. It actually made me, it was horrible because it, <laughs> I had to go through the kitchens. Well, it's their fault husband, for not telling you. And my husband had to find the man and say, we want our money. It was yeah, really right. dramatic. Yeah, right. it was awful. It's always made me very much, um, if I'm doing a sound check, I say to everyone, now, is everybody aware of the, content of what we're doing you know something a little bit risque or yeah, you know yeah. political satire that's going to you know is everyone aware of what we're doing before you do a live show you know because sure, you don't sure. want someone coming out stop this film yes <laughs> i mean i told my dear friend bob monkhouse the late and great bob monkhouse the comedian and he you know because i was i was cringing from it for, for months afterwards and and he just said, you will dine out on that. You, you will get over it. But it did take me a long time to get back on a stage after that. So w when you work with somebody like, I mean, Bob Monkhouse was so great. W was yeah. there any point at which uh, he was giving you some advice of when I do this, I do this. And, and, and this is how I, I mean, how much, because it always well, seemed was... to me like his, his routine that he used to do was so relaxed and so easy going. But I knew it must be. Well, he always said that cool. thing that. Actually, he, he was friends with my dad and they had exactly the same birthday and date. They were born wow. on the same day, on the same year. Wow. And my father was a, a manager of cabaret clubs. And so Bob had met my father and um, both men, dad and Bob Monkhouse, used to say to me, make sure you're active, you're doing it, you're right. Make sure it's a W shape, you know, in terms of start up there. Yeah, but it, the shape of a W tells you how to do your act, really, because you have to come down and be real and get some real stories out and then you know and then and then bring it back and at the end end up high again start high end high right and right. a bit of a w in between and so yeah, when you I do know. stand up it seems to me that there's a very big uh connection between musicians and comedians because number one the improvisation side of it is important and all yeah. uh, and also i mean before you do your act obviously you compose a number of areas that you want to hit yeah, next time I do this with you, we'll do it with me at the piano and I'll show you what I do. And, you know, being able to play the piano, of course, you've got a little backing track for yourself. Uh, you've got mood music. So, you know, I start telling the stories of my life and how I started off as a, as I told you. as a. Yeah. There's not, there's not that many people um, doing sort of gentle comedy at the piano, really. Um, yeah. It's kind of a bit old fashioned, but I like yeah. it. Well, and um, I only do little spots. I'm doing one on New Year's Eve. <laughs> Touch wood. Everything stays the same rules wise over here. We've got the OK in England, not in Scotland or Wales. Um, um, so I'm doing a private party and it's lovely. And people just ask me to do it. And I always end up with my um, I do Victoria Wood singing Bond themes, <laughs> um, which if you go onto my Twitter, it's my pinned tweet. And it's uh, diamonds are forever. Oh, they sting like she's really, you know, the way she sang. <laughs> and, you know, um, you only live twice. And um, the best one is um, Goldfinger is a man with a mind dish touch. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, it sounds very funny playing it. And I do it in her voice. Sure, and I do yeah, a medley yeah. of, of, of Bond themes as Victoria Wood. 
And I have to say, it brings the house down. So I always end you up. Know, some, <laughs> some of the things you're talking about where you set yourself a thing to do and then you do it. It's a bit like the the end of Mock the Week, which is a show you'd be great on, by the way. Uh, you should tr get into that show. Again. Take a genre and you mix the genre. Yeah. You, know, you, you do somebody performing something that they wouldn't normally have seen. That's, yes. the, that's where the comedy is. And uh, yes. Yes. I do like to do that. Yeah. It was Marge Simpson sings Macy Gray. Macy Gray. I'm trying to say goodbye and I <laughs> choke. I try to walk away and I crumble. <laughs> Though it's kind of hard, it's clear, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't do Macy Gray without <coughs> coughing. Without coughing, yeah. <coughs> it's a mashup, really, isn't it? Yes, indeed. And and that's, of course, contrast is what, what makes the comedy. Um, I, I did EastEnders um, a few months ago, and that was great fun to be in a, a, a soap that you've watched all your life. And, yes. And I had to change my voice and talk like that, you know. But that was lovely. But everyone, watch out for Afterlife. And uh, it's it's a really beautiful, beautiful finale to the, the, I don't even watch the other two series, but Ricky Gervais has created another masterpiece. But please yeah. watch out for me. Please watch out for me playing Penny. Her name is Penny. I want to say Happy New Year to all your peoples. Yes, do that. And it's been lovely being on here. So, I don't do podcasts for people, really, to be no, honest. No, but well, I would, well, would not miss one with you for anything. Well, we're very lucky to have you, and uh, and we'll have you again at the piano. Yes. yes. And yes. Happy New Year to all your listeners, to all your viewers, to all your fans. Yes. Mm, why don't you subscribe to Radio Witcher? Mm. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. All You're looking great, by the way. You look great. Thank you for that. I'm not saying she'd had lots of facelifts, but when she crossed her legs, her mouth used a snapshot. <laughs> <laughs> now, they say the best things in life are free, but are they really? Let's see now. Love. Well, that's never been free, except for maybe a brief period in the 60s. The moon belongs to everyone. <laughs> Try telling that to Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos. But subscribing to Radio Richard is absolutely free. It costs you nothing. Not only that, we actually pay you. <laughs> How do we pay you? I'll tell you. With thought-provoking interviews with amazing award-winning artists. Where else can you get my interviews with jazz icons like Pat Metheny, Barry Manilow, Chick Corea, Lyle Mays, Michael and Randy Brecker, Bob James, and Wayne Shorter. Come on now, like, share, and subscribe. You'll help keep this podcast alive and make the world a hipper place. Radio Richard, it's absolutely Radio free. Richard.